One summer afternoon in 1922, a petite, elegant woman led a procession into a packed arena on Long Island for what would be her last big shooting exhibition. Even at age 62, Annie Oakley never missed. She was one of the greatest sharpshooters of all time, thrilling crowds across America and Europe, feted by princes and presidents, the first American woman ever to become a superstar. Yet Oakley's beginnings were more than humble, her childhood horrific. But she had built a career doing what she loved and excelling in a man's world. And when all she had worked for nearly came crashing down, she waged the most intense battle of her life, determined never to fall back into the crippling poverty she had known, determined to save her reputation. Underlying everything that Annie Oakley said or did was an anger that I think was founded on the injustices of her own early life. The hatred of everything that was wrong, that everything that stood in the way of a person being able to realize herself. Late in 1865, a fierce blizzard swept across the plains of Indiana into western Ohio. Phoebe Ann Moses, the fifth surviving child in a Quaker farming family, waited for her father to come home from the mill, 14 miles away. It was midnight when Jacob Moses finally returned. His hands were frozen solid, his speech gone. He never recovered. Jacob died in March. Phoebe Ann, Annie, was not yet six years old. The family soon lost the farm. Bills piled up. They were destitute. To ease the burden, Annie's mother sent her to live at the county poor farm. Soon she was hired out to work as a live-in helper for a family in a neighboring county. Everyone thought this was going to be an improvement, but it turned out to be absolutely nightmarish situation. She never mentioned their name again in the rest of her life. She referred to them as the wolves. They locked her in closets. They worked her half to death. One day, the farmer's wife, the wolf, Mrs. Wolf, throws her out in the snow because she fell asleep while she was doing some darning. Suddenly, the she-wolf struck me across the ears, threw me out into the deep snow, and locked the door. I had no shoes on. I was slowly freezing to death. So I got down on my knees, looked toward God's clear sky, and tried to pray. But my lips were frozen stiff, and there was no sound. If she was sexually abused, we don't know. She certainly was physically abused. She talks about welts on her back. She talks about being a slave. I think Annie's experience with the wolves leaves such a deep impression on her that maybe it's some kind of shame. And I wonder if that shame is so deep in Annie that it influences the rest of her life. Annie endured two years with the wolves forced to help her own family survive by being one less mouth to feed. Then one day in 1872, 12-year-old Annie Moses could bear it no more. She ran away, slipped into a crowded railroad car, and made her way back to Greenville. Her mother was still unable to support another child. Annie went back to the poor farm, 
where she earned her keep working as a seamstress. At the age of 15, she finally returned to her mother. Susan Moses had remarried, but the family was still desperately poor, and a mortgage loomed over their heads. Instead of going to school, Annie taught herself to shoot. With her father's old cap and ball rifle, she headed for the woods to hunt. Soon, she was selling hampers of quail to Katzenberger's general store in Greenville. Young Annie was now the family breadwinner, earning a living with her gun. She was a market hunter and turning a very nice profit. Certainly not something that was at all appropriate for a woman to be doing in that time and place. Eventually, she saved up enough money to pay off the $200 mortgage on the family farm. And her prowess with a shotgun was becoming known around Greenville. In the 1870s, shooting well was an important skill for a man, and shooting contests were a favorite spectator sport. Sharpshooters traveled the country, betting on their ability to perform feats of marksmanship and challenging all comers. Shooting was of such immense uh, popularity that there were professionals. Doc Carver, uh, evil spirit of the plains is what he was called. Captain Bogardus, who eventually had four sons who traveled with him. And people were flocking to see shooters like this. One such shooter was Frank Butler, an Irish immigrant in his mid-twenties, Butler was just starting to make a name for himself on the variety stage. He was traveling through southern Ohio one fall, claiming he could outshoot anyone around. Frank is staying in a hotel in Cincinnati, and he starts talking with a bunch of farmers. The farmers say, hey, we have someone in our county who's a really good shot, and we're going to bet 100 bucks that this person can beat you. Butler laughed but he needed the money. The match was on. Frank Butler, this already professional shooter, shows up for this match with hundreds of people watching. And who is it that uh, comes as his opponent but a 15-year-old girl who was only uh, five feet tall and weighed 100 pounds? <laughs> the moment she appeared, Butler recalled, I was taken off guard. Annie's first shot was a hit. Both shooters hit 24 birds in a row. Then Butler missed. I stopped for an instant, Annie remembered. I knew I would win. And she did. The loser was instantly smitten. He offered Annie tickets to his next show. He must have seemed to her like a, a man of the world. That's the only way I can think of it. You know, here she's lived her whole life in the Ohio woods, and here's this man who's with the circus. He's been on the variety stage. It was chemistry. He made himself appear safe to her. He clearly admired her. He sparked and courted her as few of us have ever been sparked or courted and every one of us would like to be by someone. And she was lucky to find him and I think he knew he was lucky to find her. Frank Butler was Annie's ticket out of Greenville. They soon married. For the next six years, while Butler and his new shooting partner, John Graham, performed on the variety circuit, Annie stayed in the background. That was about to change. In 